please. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction and thank you for organizing this nice meeting. Uh, so I will talk about the connection between Gaussian and generalized polygraphs. So let's briefly revisit the uh, history and uh, the definition of polygraphs. So polygraphs are closely related to the poly construction in 1933 for constructing Hartmann matrices from quadratic residues. And uh, they were actually introduced as graphs first uh, by Sakas in 1962 and also by Aldrich and Rennie in 1963. Uh, so throughout the talk, I will use FQ to denote the finite field with Q element. Uh, for a finite field FQ, we can define a, a polygraph on it. Uh, so we call that polygraph PQ. So this is the graph whose vertices is the elements of FQ and two vertices are adjacent, if only if their difference is a square in FQ star. Uh, because we are interested in uh, finding clicks in this kind of polygraphs, we would like this graph to be an undirected graphs. So we need to further as assume that Q is congruent to one module four. And uh, this is a nice example of a polygraph with order 13. Uh, so we can see that one is uh, adjacent to two because one is a square, and one is not adjacent to three because two is not a square in this uh, specific field. And uh, roughly speaking, polygraphs correspond to squares. And if we just replace squares by uh, these powers, then we got the, the so-called D polygraphs. Uh, so, uh, so generalized polygraphs were first introduced by Cohen in the 80s, and uh, later several other authors also independently uh, discovered this type of graphs. Uh, so again, we need to assume some congruence conditions so that our graph is an undirected graph. So we, here we assume that Q is congruent to one module 2D, uh, and then we can define a D polygraph on FQ. So we denote that by GPQD, uh, so G for generalized and P for poly. So GPQD is the graph whose vertices are element in FQ and the two vertices are adjacent if and only if that difference is a this power in FQ star. Uh, so uh, people study polygraphs and generalized polygraphs because uh, they are interesting and also they uh, nicely connect many branches of mathematics such as our favorite uh, computerics and uh, also number theory. Uh, in particular, uh, algebraic graph theory and uh, analytic number theory. So there's a big conjecture in Catasum, uh, which is called a uh, polygraph conjecture. It's about giving certain upper bound on the double Catasum. Uh, so in this talk, we will focus on improving the chief upper bound on the kick number of a generalized polygraph with square order. Uh, let's first recall what's the chief upper bound. Uh, uh, before that, let me remind you what's the kick and what's the kick number. A kick in a graph is just a subgraph that is a complete graph. And uh, the kick number of a graph X denoted omega X is just the size of a maximum kick of X. Uh, for generalized polygraph GBQD, uh, the chief upper bound on the kick number is given by UQ. So there are many different approaches to prove this uh, chief upper bound. So we can use, for example, uh, pigeonhole principle, we can use algebraic graph theory, we can use catasum, we can use discrete geometry, but all these methods uh, give this uh, bound UQ. Uh, and in the literature, we just call this chief upper, uh, we just call this bound chief upper bound. Uh, it turned out that improving this shiva upper bound on the kick number is extremely difficult. Uh, so uh, before trying to prove this chip upper bound, we should first ask when is the chip upper bound tight? Uh, so basically there are two cases. The first case is that Q is a non-square. In that case, uh, the chip upper bound is UQ, which is not an integer, so the chip upper bound is never tight. But in the case that Q is a square, uh, it's possible that the chip upper bound is tight. Uh, and in fact, in 1988, Abrauer, uh, Doman, and Ridley show that if Q is a square and D divides root Q plus one, then the kick number of GPQD is given by root Q. And uh, the reason they consider this kind of uh, divisibility condition is, the, is because of the following lemma. Uh, so this lemma basically says that uh, the subfield with root Q element forms a kick in GPQD if and only if D divides uh, root Q plus one. So for, the, for this, that might should be easy to verify. 
uh, now it should make sense that uh, this statement is true because once we assume that d dy is through q plus one, uh, this subfield with through q element uh, automatically forms a kick in GPQD. Uh, so that means the chip upper bound uh, on the kick number is tight. And in fact, in this paper, they also show that if d dy is through q plus one, then the chromatic number of GPQD is also given by real q. And the, the proof of that is again not too difficult once we realize this uh, this subfield structure. And uh, so, as uh, as a remark, if d dy through q plus one, they actually show that both the both the chromatic number and the kick number of GPQD are equal to root q. So we can ask whether the converse is also true. And uh, it turned out that uh, it's true. And it was proved by uh, Snyder and Sherwa in 2015. Uh, so they show that the chromat both the chromatic number and the, the kick number of GPQD is given by root Q if and only if D divides through Q plus one. So we know that if D divides through Q plus one, then the, the stuff with through Q element forms a kick. Uh, then it follows easily that the chromatic number and the, the kick number is given by UQ. But for the reverse direction, it's much more difficult to prove that. And uh, they use some uh, algebraic approach, uh, in particular some, uh, uh, some result on group theory to prove that. Uh, so let's try to consider uh, what's the typical structure of the kick in a journalist's pedigraph. Uh, so actually, there was a more general result proved by Green in 2004. So he used uh, additive combinatorics and also poly, poly uh, and also probabilistic method to show that a typical kick in a Kelly graph has size roughly O log the size of the graph. Uh, so in particular, because generalized Kelly graph is just a special family of uh, Kelly graphs, we can also apply uh, that to show that. Any uh, to show that a typical kick in a generalized paragraph GPQD has size uh, roughly uh, log scale. Uh, but if the chief upper bound on the kick number is tight, that means we have a kick with size root Q. Uh, then that means this kick must have a very special algebraic structure. And uh, intuitively, uh, we may guess that uh, this special algebraic structure is just given by the subfield structure. We can also see that uh, by looking at these two statements. Uh, so our main result just confirms this heuristic. So uh, if Q is a square, we show that uh, the kick number of GPQD is given by root Q if and only if D divides uh, root Q plus one. Uh, in other words, the kick number is given by root Q if and only if the subfield with root Q element forms a kick. And uh, in particular, this implies that if D does not divide root Q uh, plus one, we are able to improve the chip upper bound by one. And uh, we can clearly see that this result proves the result in the uh, previous page. Uh, so for this result, we are able to remove the assumption on the chromatic number. And for this result, we are able to get an if and only if condition. And uh, you may wonder why is this result interesting? Because we just improved the triple upper bound by one. But once we uh, try to revisit the uh, recent development on this uh, triple upper bound on the kick number, we will find that uh, this is not to, uh, this is a non trivial statement. So before 2013, uh, essentially there were no improvement on the triple upper bound. So uh, the chip of one is through Q, so just recall that. And uh, the first uh, improvement was done by uh, Beckel, Metalushi, and the Ruja in 2013, which they show that omega PQ is bounded by root Q minus one for half of the known squares Q. So that means uh, for, no, for half of the known squares Q, they were able to improve the chip of bound by one. And uh, the proof is, uh, is by no means uh, trivial. Uh, it's a, a clever cut, uh, observation on the cat sum estimate. And uh, the next breakthrough was by uh, Hansen and Petitis in 2019, where they improved the uh, trivial upper bound by a multiplicative uh, constant. So let's show that if we consider a generalized pedigraph uh, with prime order, 
that we can uh, improve the chip up from root p to this uh, root p over d as a small constant. So this is a multiplicative uh, constant improvement, and uh, uh, and this is the best known upper bound. And data uh, last year, uh, my supervisor Joseph Soimoshi and his two PhD students, uh, Daniel D. Benedetto and Ethan White, were able to derive the same upper bound uh, using a, a, a completely different approach. Uh, so what they did is to improve the lower bound on the number of directions determined by a Cartesian product over a, a fine Galois plane over uh, the prime field FP. And uh, uh, both these two methods uh, use polynomial method. For Hansen and Pagetti's proof, they use Dapnos method. And for this uh, direction approach, they use uh, Whaley polynomials with Sunny extension. Uh, and uh, uh, the next question is whether this kind of result can be extended to a general finite field. And I guess the answer is yes, because I was able to do so. So I extended this, uh, the, the method to a general finite field. And I showed that uh, I extended Hansen and Pagetti's method to show the following. So if Q is a non square and D divides uh, P minus one, then we can show that roughly we can get a bound which is very similar to Hansen and Pagetti's bound. And uh, that's a talk I uh, gave last year on Kent. So I won't go deep into it. And uh, also we can try to generalize the direction result to prove the following, uh, which is uh, if D is at least three, then the kick number of GPQD uh, is bounded by UQ minus Dito OP for almost all uh, non squares Q. Uh, so that means we can uh, improve the chip upper bound by say P to the 0.99. So if we pick this, uh, function op to be p to the 0.99, we can show that for almost all non squares q, the kick number is bounded by uq minus p to the 0.99. And uh, the proof essentially used one uh, important result from, uh, uh, from analytic number three. So basically that says that uh, uh, if we consider the fractional part of square root q, the q is a non square, then uh, this kind of rational part are equally distributed. And uh, you can already see that uh, here it's, uh, it's very important to assume that Q is a non square because if Q is a square, then the fractional part of root Q is always given by zero. So there's no equal distribution. So we cannot conclude anything uh, but better than the chip upper bound. So uh, to conclude for some technical reasons, this kind of method failed to work for squares Q in general. Uh, and uh, before my result, actually there is no improvement to the uh, chip of a bound when Q is a square. So that's why uh, this kind of result is sort of interesting. Uh, so our approach is the uh, catasum approach or equivalently fully analytic approach. So we didn't use a uh, polynomial method. And uh, the key is to find a nice connection between Gaussian and the uh, generalized polygraphs. And then but because we have a, a fairly good understanding of Gaussian, we can use the result on Gaussian to deduce something about generalized polygraphs. And also conversely, uh, we know something about generalized polygraph. We can use that to deduce information about Gaussian. So that's perhaps an interesting uh, connection between these two objects. Uh, so, uh, so I should define the uh, Gauss sum, but before doing that, I need to uh, first introduce the trace functions. Uh, so uh, I will use trace to denote the absolute trace function, trace FQ. So that means if Q is the power of P, let's say Q is equal to P to the M, then for any alpha in FQ, we will define uh, trace alpha to be alpha plus alpha to the P uh, up to alpha to the P to the M minus one. So perhaps the most uh, uh, important property of the trace function is that it's, it's a linear map. Uh, and then uh, for any uh, multiplicative character of FQ, uh, we can define the Gauss sum associated to this character chi. Uh, so we denote that by G chi, and uh, it's given by the sum of chi C times EP trace C, where C runs over the whole field FQ. 
And uh, that's because some basic properties of Gaussian. Uh, I guess uh, this kind of uh, result is real known. So the modulus of G chi is always given by GQ unless chi is given by the trivial cutter. And uh, this kind of result allows us to define the, uh, the normalized Gaussian. So we define epsilon chi to be G chi over UQ. Uh, then because the, the modulus of G chi is given by UQ uh, for any non-trivial character. So we see that uh, epsilon chi lies on the uh, unit circle for any non-trivial character. Uh, the next demo is about uh, the Fourier transform, uh, the basic properties of the uh, Fourier transform. Uh, so it basically says that we can express chi A as the linear combination of chi C, where C runs over all FQ. And uh, it's also uh, uh, connect the character with this Gaussian uh, one with G chi. So that's uh, important. And uh, we will use this to understand the uh, character song. Uh, so uh, because we want to improve the trivial upper bound on the gig number, we should first uh, recover the trivial upper bound and then try to see if we can improve that. So uh, there are, as I said, there are many different approaches to recover the trivial upper bound. And here we, we use the catasum approach. Uh, so if chi is a non-trivial multiplicity character of FQ, Therefore, any uh, subset of FQ, we can try to bound this double character sum. Uh, so actually, paragraph conjecture is about uh, uh, estimate on the upper bound of this double character sum. And I guess it's widely open. And so no one can do better than this, uh, like the trivial upper bound. Uh, so uh, anyway, for, for our purpose, we don't need to uh, like tackle the petty graph conjecture. We just need to give a non-trivial, uh, we just need to give a, like a more or less the trivial estimate of the character sum. And then we will use this character sum result to recover the trivial upper bound on the cake number. So suppose we are working on the generalized petty graph GPQD, then obviously we should take a character uh, to be a multiplicative character of FQ with order D. Then we'll consider a maximum kick A in this generalized paragraph GPQD, and we will let D to be minus A. Then by the definition of generalized paragraph GPQD, uh, for any little a in the set A and any little b in the set B, we always have uh, A plus V equal to zero, or A plus B is a disk power in FQ star. Uh, in the lat latter case, uh, chi a plus b will be equal to one. So uh, it's easy to uh, get uh, this double character sum. It's just given by the size of a square minus the size of a. Uh, on the other hand, we can use this uh, character sum estimate to bound this double character sum. And by combining these two estimates, we can get this kind of inequality. Uh, the final step is to uh, just do a re rearrangement. And then we can show that the size of A is bounded by UQ. And uh, because A is uh, a maximum kick, that just means the kick number of GPQD is bounded by UQ. Uh, okay, so uh, just some rough idea on how to uh, prove this uh, as, uh, sum estimate. So we use the standard Fourier analytic approach. Uh, so we express uh, the each chi a plus b as a linear combination of chi c. And then we just use some uh, a bunch of inequalities and estimate. So we use uh, triangle inequality, we use uh, cauchy schwarz inequality, and also uh, use orthogonality relations to, uh, to, to estimate these exponential sums. And uh, finally, we need to use the fact that this Gaussian has modules UQ. Uh, so uh, if we try to understand when does the uh, chip upper bound on the kick number is tight, we just need to understand when does this uh, character sum estimate is tight. Uh, so recall that in the proof we use triangle inequality and we know that uh, 
triangle inequality becomes an equality if and only if uh, those kind of numbers uh, share the same argument as complex numbers. So intuitively, uh, this kind of uh, uh, estimate is tied only if the complex number g chi, so this Gaussian g chi, uh, shares the argument with some chi c. And uh, because chi c, uh, because chi is a uh, character with order d, chi c is just uh, this root of unity. So in particular, it implies that the normalized Gaussian uh, epsilon chi is just a digit of unity. Uh, and uh, we can make this kind of reasoning precise. Uh, and we can conclude that if the chip upper bound is tight, then the normalized Gaussian epsilon chi must be a D3 of unity. Uh, alternatively, uh, we can conclude that the Gaussian is pure. Uh, so we say a Gaussian is pure if some non zero integral power of G chi is a real number. Uh, and here, because GKI is just epsilon chi times uh, root cube, then we can always uh, take a, a non-zero integral power of GKI to make it a real number. And moreover, we can conclude something stronger. Uh, so we can we can deduce some information about the Fourier coefficient. Uh, so just to recall, what's the definition of this kind of uh, Fourier coefficient? So if we consider this indicator function of the set A, then uh, it's fully a uh, it's, it's fully a transform it's fully a transform evaluated at the point C is given by one over Q times uh, this uh, exponential sum over uh, the set A. Uh, so what we can uh, conclude is that for any maximum kick A, this uh, fully a coefficient vanish for any uh, chi C not equal to uh, epsilon chi. Uh, so uh, roughly speaking, if the trivial upper bound is tight, then the Gaussian must be pure. So the next question is that can we give an explicit uh, formula for the Gaussian? And uh, if we can do so, then probably we, we just solve the problem. Uh, but the answer is unfortunately no, because uh, it's very difficult to uh, find an explicit formula for the Gaussian in general. But for a particular family of Gaussian, we can do so. And that family is called super singular Gaussian and uh, sometimes called semi-primitive Gaussian. And of course, this kind of terminologies are borrowed from algebraic geometry. Uh, so basically, uh, roughly speaking, if minus one is a power of P module uh, D and uh, chi is a multiplicative character with order D, uh, then we say G chi is super singular. And uh, we have this kind of uh, well-known uh, result, uh, which is uh, Stickerberger's theorem to compute uh, uh, Gaussian explicitly. Uh, so basically, we just need to find uh, a minimal t, such as minus one is congruent to p to the t module d. Then we can easily compute the Gaussian. So the original proof of Stickelberger was quite big, uh, was quite deep. It used uh, deep algebraic geometry, and later uh, I guess there are some simplified proofs, but they are uh, like two or three pages long. And uh, next, I will present a very short proof and very simple proof uh, using uh, journalized paragraphs. So. Uh, a standard method to prove the general version of Stickelberger theorem is to first prove the following special case, and then we will apply Hasse-Davenport lifting theorem. Uh, so the special case is that uh, if we consider a character with order d uh, dividing root cube plus one, then we can easily compute a chi. And you may notice that uh, here we have the condition d divides root cube plus one, and uh, this sounds very familiar. And actually, we just use this uh, condition to construct this kind of uh, generalized paragraph, GPQD. So this paragraph is uh, well defined. And uh, because D divides root Q plus one, it's clear that the, the click number is given by root Q because uh, the subfield with root Q element forms a maximum click. Uh, then we can use this kind of uh, statement, which says that for any maximum kick A, uh, this Fourier coefficient vanishes for any uh, C such as chi C does not equal to uh, uh, epsilon chi. Uh, so in other words, if we can find some C such as 
this Fourier coefficient is not zero, then we must have chi c equal to epsilon chi. So that's how we compute uh, the Gauss sum. Uh, so because uh, this kick is just a finite, uh, just a subfield, then we can use the transitivity of the trace map uh, to find such c. Uh, so in particular, for any c such as c to the root q minus one is minus one, we can easily check that uh, this Fourier coefficient does not vanish. That means chi c equal to epsilon chi. So to compute epsilon chi, we just need to compute chi c. Uh, that's uh, fairly easy. Uh, so I know I'm running out of time, so I will just briefly talk about the rough idea to finish the proof. Uh, so we have shown that uh, if the kick number, if the chip alpha bond of the kick number is tight, then the Gauss sum must be pure. But actually, uh, we can also show that uh, it's super singular. So we need to use some relation between pure Gauss sum and super singular Gauss sum. And we also need to use some nice properties of generalized uh, pay graph. Uh, then uh, after we deduce that G chi is super singular, we can just use DQ Berger's theorem to compute G chi explicitly. And then uh, we have just have two, case, two cases left. The first case is that D is odd and the D does not dy root Q plus one. In that case, we can compute that epsilon chi is actually given by minus one. Uh, but because minus one is not a this root of unity when D is odd, uh, that means we have finished the proof. And uh, when D is uh, even we just need to use uh, uh, the following eldritch Corrado property of Pelligrass. So that's again a very nice property of Pelligrass. That's first proved by Brookhouse in 1984. It says that, uh, roughly speaking, the only maximum kicks in the Pelligrass is given by the subfield. So that concludes my talk, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Um... Are there any questions for our speaker? If not, then I thank Chi Hoi for his talk. And uh, the next talk will be in uh, three or four minutes. <laughs>